Welcome to the Lutchens Trust America webinar, Drawing on Glass with Soap, Lutchens, Proportion, and Perception, produced in collaboration with the Lutchens Trust in the UK. I'm Robin Prater, the Executive Director of the Lutchens Trust America. Marcos Lutchens and I will be serving as host and moderator. We are pleased to have Edward Ford and Oliver Cope as our panelists today. The idea for this webinar came out of a conversation between Marcos Lutchens and one of our LTA members, Anna Palma Mann, about a book written by Edward Ford, The Details of Modern Architecture, which contains a chapter on Lutchens. That immediately caught our attention and it turned out that Oliver Cope had, had the book in his library and was very familiar with it. So we have really enjoyed exploring Professor Ford's ideas about Lutchens design work. Let me introduce our panel. Edward R. Ford is a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia and continues to write and teach. He was the 2021 Faye Jones Professor of Architecture at the University of Arkansas, the 2020 McDermott Visiting Professor of Architecture at the University of Texas, Austin, and a visiting professor at Washington University, St. Louis in 2019. Professor Ford is the author of The Details of Modern Architecture, Volumes 1 and 2, as well as The Architectural Detail and Five Houses, Ten Details. His latest book, Searching for Authenticity, Rustic Architecture in America, will be coming out next spring. In addition to his books, Professor Ford has published articles in numerous professional journals and has written a number of book chapters and introductions. He was a contributor to the Wiley Companion to Architecture, consulted in the 1992 American Heritage Dictionary, and is a member of the editorial board of the 12th edition of the Architectural Graphic Standards. We are very pleased to have Professor Ford to join us today for this webinar. Oliver Cope is the principal of the award-winning architectural design firm Oliver Cope Architect, located in New York City. The firm specializes in classically American homes in a variety of historical styles. Oliver received an AB from Harvard College in 1980, a Master of Architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design in 1985, and was a visiting assistant professor of architecture at the University of Cincinnati. His early career experiences was at the firms of Bayer Blender Bell Architects and Planners in New York City and David P. Handlin Association Associates in Cambridge, Massachusetts, before he established the firm of Arthur Oliver Cope Architect in New York in 1988. Oliver is licensed in the states of New York, Connecticut, Maryland, Florida, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, and is in active in a number of architectural organizations most important to us, the, the Lutchens Trust America. We are very fortunate to have Oliver on our board. If you have questions during the webinar, please post them in the Q&A box and we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be placed on our website at www.lutchenstrustamerica.com and on our YouTube channel. Before I turn over to our panel, I'd like to thank you for watching. We appreciate the support of those of you who have joined either the Lutchens Trust America or the Lutchens Trust. You make these webinars possible. New members are always welcome. And now over to Ed and Oliver. Are we ready? Yes. Uh, well, I'm honored and pleased to uh, be with you all today. Um, let's move to the next, actually the next two slides. Next. Okay, there. If you were a uh, ambitious young architect in England at the end of the 19th century, there were certain things that which were uh, necessary, obligations, not written down, but something you had to do if you wanted to be successful. And the most important of these was arguably a sketchbook. You had to produce a sketchbook. Your education in architecture came by wandering the landscapes of England and hopefully the continent as well and making meticulous records of what you saw there. And if you were successful, this could lead to a career. 
The drawing on the right is from Richard Norman Shaw's sketchbook. It was published on his return. And in the 1880s, he was arguably England's leading architect. The one on the left is by Ernest George. George was a big fan of this system. He published his sketchbook. Uh, and uh, he always came back from vacation with a couple more to share with his office. And these became the, the resources for the, the designs that they were doing. A person that did not like this system was uh, a draftsman in George's office, uh, Edward Lutchens. He thought the whole enterprise was a waste of paper and time. He certainly spent his hours wandering the uh, the English uh, landscape, but uh, he didn't keep a sketchbook. He used a technique of holding up a sheet of glass and drawing on it with a sharpened bar of soap. I'm a little skeptical of this story, but uh, two of your members have proved that this is possible. So Robin, you, there we go. And play the video maybe. Yeah. This was this was from our, one of our first uh, Lutchen's trips, and uh, Anki Barnes showed up with piece of a, a pouch full of uh, glass panels that he shared with with the other architects and and chalk and they they gave the technique a try apparently this is something Lutchens did as a, as a boy wandering around Thursley and then and then dispensed with it <laughs> because I think but he'd he'd learned what he needed to know and filed it away in his brain. Okay. Uh, we don't. None of these uh, legends drawings survive, but I think it's not hard to imagine what they looked like. He had uh, he developed early on a very distinct, somewhat eccentric uh, way of sketching that he followed through his whole life. These are two later drawings of the upfall and the uh, Liverpool Cathedral, but they're very typical of, of the way he visualized, the way he conceived what he was doing. He drew these little three-point perspectives, which is, uh, I'm gonna, gonna start my pointer here. Uh, he drew in this, um, where the lines converge toward the top. It's the view you get of a building if you're looking up at it. And uh, he always did it this way, which is actually pretty unusual. And they also, because of that, they they seem to be from well, from the ground level of the building, even in the case of the one on the left, almost underground, that site is pretty flat. But uh, again, most of the drawings he made were in this, the sketches he made were in this, this style. Next. The drawing below is uh, an office drawing. It's one of his draftsmen. This is from, from 1915. And uh, over to the right of uh, the draftsman's drawing is a little perspective it's the, that uh, Lutchens has, has, uh, has made. Uh, this is the normal procedure where the designer goes around, looks to the draftsman and makes revisions and changes and so forth. The interesting thing is the upper upper uh, image is an enlargement of that. He doesn't, it's exactly what is shown in the orthogonal drawing. He's not redesigning it. He's really just testing it out. That it's as if he trusted this uh, little perspective more than he trusted the orthogonal drawing. Next. Uh, the distinction that he was drawing in three point rather than two point is important. Uh, these are two views of a late Lutchett's building. This is the Midland Bank in, in London. Uh, the one on the uh, right is a two point perspective, which means that these uh, 
the lines of the building are parallel to the frame of the drawing. And is a greatly preferred way to, to do this simply because it avoids these sort of frantic uh, triangles you get when you're drawing in three point, which is what, this is a slide, but it's essentially what you would get if you drew it from this point of view. And it would have to be that way because you would have to look up to see the whole building. Uh, Cyril Ferry was a professional renderer. He was a, per, a great artist in his own right. He was, uh, legends would bring him in at the end of a job to do sort of the official portrait of the bank. It's the drawing they would show to the client or to the public or whatever. It's not a way legends ever drew in terms of working things out. He was far more likely to get draw on three point. The argument in favor of the three point is it's much closer to what you would actually see. Because if you look, at this drawing, this is about the level at which uh, the view is taken. It's about 40 feet off the ground, well back from the building. It's not a view of the building that you would get. What well, it might seem uh, that I'm saying that Lutyen's view of the world as he as it saw it through the lens of his glass or his eye, and, and that's the way he understood buildings, which doesn't seem like any great uh, revolution, but the fact is a lot of architects would say this is not a way to understand a building. It's a way to perceive a building and it's an important one, but it could be superficial or partial. Next. There are very few Palladio perspectives. Um, more commonly, he would draw an orthogonal projection, straight on elevation, straight on section plan, whatever. This is because what was important to him was proportions. He believed, as did all of his Renaissance compatriots, that you could mathematically define beauty. That uh, good architecture, for example, was a question of simple ratios. This on the left is uh, Whitcower's plans of various uh, Palladian uh, villas. They're all squares, double squares, squares and a half. But again, this was the methodology for beauty. Next. And it was true, it wasn't just a methodology, it was the nature of the universe. That is, this was true of everything, chords and music, everything, beauty could be described mathematically in any of the arts. And to Leonardo, it grew out of the body. The body could also be understood as a square inside in a circle. Next. And this was particularly true of the orders. Uh, if you've ever read a Renaissance treatise, you know that most of them are rather tedious uh, enumerations of, of mathematical ratios. But that was the key to the whole system. Uh, this is chambers. But again, this dimension is the column diameter. And that determines everything about this order, about the building. The column is six diameters high. The entablature and with the cornice is is two and a half column diameters. So, and of course it changes depending on Corinthian or so forth. But again, these ratios were the basis of making something truly beautiful, not just one's perception. Next. So there is actually a prejudice against perspectives, uh, particularly in the Ecole of Arts Arts, which was the major architecture school of the 19th century. Since beauty was about proportion, you needed to make straight on elevations, straight on sections so that you could you could perceive the ratios between the column height and the column width. Next. Uh, which produced some rather strange but interesting drawings. The drawing on the right is from a, a prize winner at the Cold of Beaux-Arts. It is a elevation of the Acropolis. Uh, this on your left is a uh, perspective of the Acropolis. Perspectives, again, weren't allowed at the Beaux-Arts because in this drawing, you get the, the Propylaea is drawn at the same scale as the Parthenon, and you can see that what the proportions of these buildings are and their relative size and relations to one another. A perspective gives you a distorted view and perhaps believing the Propylaea is larger than the Parthenon. Next. Well, obviously there were problems with the system right away. It's it's fine to say uh, 
that a building is well proportioned, but if you can't perceive those proportions or if you misperceive those proportions, is it really uh, effective? And it became apparent quite a, right away that as buildings got larger, it, it became harder and harder to see the relationships between the parts. This is the uh, front of the Louvre. This is, is uh, Peralt. But if you look at this cornice, for example, uh, since it was a, a long way away from you, you couldn't see its correct ratio or its correct proportion the relation to the things that were much closer to you. Peralt worked out this system for enlarging uh, cornices as they got taller. This is eye level here. This is the size of the cornice as it should be according to uh, whatever treatise he was using. But what he did was you wrote these, wrote this up to this point, and then you project it outward from the eye view so that you get the actual size of the cornice, which is here, which is what was done in this, this facade. So it was recognized that as the buildings got larger, you were going to have, if you wanted to preserve the, the perception of these proportions, you had to make changes. Next. And this was particularly true in a time period we're dealing with here, 1890 to 1910, where they were building a lot of tall buildings. And a lot of them were, were trying to do this using the orders. Uh, the drawing, the, the image on the right is the... Uh, uh, Palazzo Grimani. This is San Michele, about 1550. The building on the left is the old uh, Tiffany building. It's still there on, on Fifth Avenue at Stanford White or McKinney and White. It's a pretty close uh, uh, model of, of the San Michele building, but the difference, of course, is it's quite a bit taller. I think it's, it's actually on the order of about eight or 10 stories tall. But you can see right away that the cornice here is quite a bit larger than it would, would be in a building like uh, the Romani. Next. Again, here's them all uh, together. You notice that the entablature here, this is Romani, is the same on the top floor as it is on the first floor, as it should be because the, the order is the same. In the Stanford White building, the entablature here is one size. The entablature at the top is almost twice as much. This is white, uh, basically adjusting the size of the pieces to allow for the diminution in perspective as things get farther away from you. Next. Uh, several years after that, McKim, Mead and White got another even taller building just down uh, the street a bit from the Tiffany building. And here, the cornice really takes off. You look at the column size here in relation to the cornice size. It's pretty large. You can see that they've actually, this the typical classical cornice would be something like this. What they've done is basically doubled it to get the scale of cornice they needed for this, uh, uh, this taller building. Next. And McKinley Dwight cared a lot about this. This is the Boston uh, Public Library, not that tall a building, but McKim had them uh, build a full-scale plaster mock-up of the cornice. Uh, this, the building is only up to about this point, but he wanted to make sure it was the right proportions. The only way to do that was to build a model, put it in place, look at it from the ground and make sure it was right. Well, what did Lutchins do about this? Uh, no cornice, no problem. It's a, a bit of a shock to see these two uh, buildings. These are buildings from the 20s. They're pretty tall for Lutchens. They're two uh, versions of the Midland Bank. One on the right is in uh, London. I've already showed you the rendering of it. The one on the left is in uh, Liverpool. Uh, so by taking away the cornice, he solve the problem of having to adjust it to correct the uh, distortions of height. But what is really fascinating and frankly uh, hard to explain is that he actually exaggerated the distortion that causes by, uh, it's caused by height. Next. This is the Liverpool Bank. 
the width of this window is five feet. The width of this window is four foot nine, and the width of this window is four foot six. And if you look at the windows, of course, uh, I doubt that you would see that. He's exaggerating the foreshortening that occurs uh, when you look up at a building. That is, he's making it look even taller, uh, even more uh, out of proportion than it would have had to be tried to uh, maintain the, the orders. Next. This is the, uh, the London uh, building. I don't recall the exact dimensions, but if you look at the typical stone courses here, uh, each one is different. Each stone is, I believe, an eighth of an inch uh, small, shorter than the one below it and recessed back an eighth of an inch. If you look at both buildings, you can see that the uh, walls are slightly canted back, again, to exaggerate, much like a legend's drawing, the height, the height of the building. Okay, next. Ed, I'll just comment here that the Midland Bank London is now the Ned Hotel. Oh, that's he would have liked that. I'm going to throw in uh, a building here by uh, a graduate of the Ecole de Beaux Arts. This is Bernard Maybeck, 1916. Uh, again, uh, Maybeck had been trained to draw this way. It's interesting to see his take on the orders. He, like uh, Lutyens and Maybeck, both. Uh, change the orders, the dimensions, the proportions to suit their purposes. In both case, cases, they made them fatter than they were supposed to be, according to somebody like Chambers. The reason I'm showing you the Maybeck thing is that he's he's taking kind of the opposite approach of Legends. Legends made his buildings really bottom heavy. Uh, Maybeck, in this case, did precisely the opposite. If it's anything a bit precarious with these gigantic uh, flower boxes on top of the Corinthian columns. Okay, next. So, uh, three contrasting views of, of the world. Uh, Top-heavy Maybeck, bottom-heavy uh, Lutyens, and uh, something in between with uh, McKim, Mead, and White. I think, uh, I think McKim, Mead, and White were trying to establish themselves as a legitimate classicist to compare with Bramante and, and Palladio. And although they did a lot of fooling around, they were sticking with the basic language of classicism. I think Maybeck, of course, was enjoyed the picturesque. He actually wanted the palace to look like a ruin, and I think he wanted it to look a bit, uh, perhaps not unstable, but perhaps it'd be a bit uh, sublime to use an old term. Luncheon's building, it is monumental, and intentionally so, and he was an architect of monuments, whether it was the palace in New Delhi or the bank, major bank in England, and I think it is the job of monumentality to look to look permanent, to look stable, and perhaps to be a bit intimidating on occasion. And there's no doubt that this technique, this very, uh, very heavy rusticated base, very deep windows, and very light top, added to this this sort of stability, if you will, of of the uh, of the building. Okay, next. Uh, I'll just uh, end the series with this one. This is uh, this is a little, not that little. It's a, the War Memorial in Leicester. Uh, you might assume from all this that uh, again, Legends very interested in these perceptual distortions, modulating walls, cornice heights, window openings had no interest in the sort of Palladian view of the world. That is this geometric uh, uh, ratio is a very simple uh, segments. But in fact, Lutyens was no less interested in that than he was in the other. And uh, this is a case in point. Uh, if you look at the, actually you have to look at the drawing here, you can see that the stone courses here are slightly larger than the stone courses here and slightly, and, these again are slightly smaller than the one below. There is a graduation of 
of sizes against something like what we saw in the two banks. Next. Again, this is a close-up view of that. Uh, next. But I'll refer to you this article. Uh, Lutyens, there's no question he used uh, ratios and proportions and, and something uh, certainly similar to Palladio and Spirit in, in using squares or rotated squares in this case. But in this case, he's doing it within the uh, uh, or within this framework, all these distortions take place. So he used both systems. Um, this article goes through a lengthy uh, series of propositions of what exactly the proportional mm -hmm. systems were that Lutyens used. Uh, there's a lot of debate about them. His, his son wrote a book with an elaborate description about a system that involved the number 22. I don't have the time or, frankly, the ability to explain <laughs> these systems, but uh, I refer you to this article. Uh, I think there seems to be uh, some scholars feel like he used these sort of tools when it suited his purpose and that there wasn't a sort of office rule book or, or a kind of doctrinaire Palladian-like uh, manifesto about how this would be done. It would just simply vary with the building. But this is one that actually uh, uses both. Okay. Can I, I'll interject one thing there just because then I'm sorry. Well, why don't you take over? Well, I, that, uh, the, if we go back one slide, I just want to point out something that I think sort of fun and we see it too. We saw a Vitruvian man. And I, I, I think if you look at Lutyens, you regularly see a kind of anthropomorphism in his proportioning. And we've got this eye and this eye <laughs> got this here so the faces exist within the same system and it's it just jumped out at me because of your bringing up vitruvius earlier um and in terms of the 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 toolkit and and the rule book or whatever that they they had i think the next slide um uh, this, this, and I'll preface this by a couple of things. First of all, um, I'm grateful to be involved at all in this because Ed's done really all the heavy lifting. Um, what we like to do in the webinars that I've been involved in in the past is we're really opening doors for people to go back and, and, and look beyond. So either go back and look at webinars that we've already done or do your own investigation. The, the, Diagrams on the left here come from a webinar we did on Lutyen's use of proportion. And he clearly used it, but to Ed's point, it, he didn't use the same system every time. He varied it depending on the particular project. So it's 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 worth looking at. He's regulating things, but the two-dimensional um, sort of orth, orthogonal system exists, but he's also pursuing a three-dimensional system at the same time. I think the next slide is yours. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, there's a, this, this, Ed brought this little cartoon um, on the left, which shows how Lutyen's um, sort of reduces the freeze Till it becomes vestigial or almost non-existent, and in doing so, he exaggerates the height because he's reduced the scale of an element that we might be visually familiar with. And then, in we just happened to talk about these sketches which we saw during one of our trips um, to Homewood, and right in here is a little doodle of a of a cornice which is very much related to this sketch i think he included in a letter to his wife um talking about the issue himself so um these these were his initial drawings that still reside at, at homewood and the owners were kind enough to pull them out and show us uh next Next. 
uh, say a little bit about uh, the difference between architecture and sculpture and how it pertains to legends. Um, it's it's useful to talk about uh, a lot of legends fans, a lot of scholars have have speculated about the way in which he can be seen in relation to modernism. I don't think there's any evidence that he had any uh, contact with Cubists like Wyndham Lewis or any cared about it particularly, but there are certain affinities that go on. Uh, his, his engagement with abstraction, legends engages with abstraction, for example, particularly in relation to the, uh, the war memorials. He clearly had a sort of taste for ambiguity of, of things, sort of both and, to use Venturi phrase, of things that could be both additive and subtractive at the same time. I'm going to talk about one of those here. Uh, this is, of course, this, this elephant at, uh, at uh, Delhi. But there's a lot, there's not that much sculpture and literal sculpture in, in Legend's work, but very often, when it takes place, there's a typical legends building has a kind of plane. And often, even things like this elephant are carved out of it. If you look at it carefully, it's only the elephant's head that exists outside the frame of the, of the uh, building, and the rest of the elephant starts turning into architecture rather quickly. But the sort of carving out of something that you expect it to be added on or the sort of ambiguity about what is happening. Is this a piece added onto the building or something carved out of it? It's something he clearly, uh, well, they like to play with it, but he also used it to affect. Okay, next. Uh, there are uh, a few buildings by Lecce's that we'd call carved out. They're not typical of his work, but there's some of the more uh, the best loved ones. Uh, certainly Lindisfarne, out of necessity, was carved out of a rock. Castle Drogo was uh, a built uh, excavation, but it it has this quality, particularly this this uh, this incredible uh, kitchen, which seems to be subterranean, and the sort of volume that you get in the particularly in the lower parts of the house. There's another quality of legends here. Uh, we won't really have time to talk about. He, he, he loved these sort of very flat, and to me, very cubist, very shallow uh, explorations of layers of wall that were very close together, but still separate. But in any case, uh, next. It's the outside where you really see this carving. And you can go around the building drawing sort of simple rectilinear shapes and see that what he's really doing is sort of carving out of this rectangle, which is established by the this window, for example, and any other. If this were Richard Norman Shaw, this would be a projecting bay window. Lutchins pulls it back into the wall, so it's literally carved out of it rather than projecting from it. Like the plane is a smooth plane across here. This is very uh, unmedieval sort of fins on this wall to fill it out as, as as a volume. So this is another case of these ambiguities, something that we would expect to project becomes rather a, 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 a kind of remains of the excavation of the wall. Next. Um, the, the carving is something that uh, is clearly something that's happening three in three dimensions. It's volumetric, but I particularly love this plan. It's from Walton Manor, which is actually an assemblage of a group of town homes. They're not really town houses the way we think of them here in New York, for example, but it was a series of connected houses on the outskirts of a village. And he was called on to renovate it and make alterations. And this fragment of a plan, which is in Peter Inskip's uh, book, which is an Academy Edition monograph on Lutchens that I think was done in the early 80s. I've certainly owned it, I think, since 85 or 86. Um, 
But the way he treats the plan, being at once constrained by the 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 walls of the townhomes and then um, ignores those constraints to make this circular room, the projecting bay, and then the the stairs which he projects out. There's something just for me palpable and material that's very analogous to the way he's approaching the sculptures at Drogo or at Delhi and other places. That's my interjection for the moment. Uh, it's this kind of carving is is particularly uh, evident in when Lecce starts to uh, incorporate the classical orders. This is Heathcote, of course, which is the first systematic use of the orders. Truth is, there aren't really that many columns at uh, Heathcote. Next, uh, there's a couple. There's one here, of course, basic Doric, and it has a basic Doric. Uh, entablature. Uh, these things are typically called phantom columns. There's a capital here, and there's a base. Here's a capital, and here's a base. I think that may be Lechen's term for them, that he called them phantom columns. They're, they're, they exist within the wall. Uh, and the wall itself, there's a projecting cornice, but the wall itself is more carved out than added on. These these columns don't project. It's only the little pieces of the of the capital and the base that do. Okay, next. Uh, like a lot of Lutyen's uh, inventions, it, it turns out to have a precedent, which he may or may not have been aware of. This is uh, San Michele again. Uh, this is the Porta Nuova in Verona. It's a fortification, get shot at regularly, so it doesn't have a lot of delicate work. But if you look right here, there's exactly the same detail you saw at uh, at uh, 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 the building we just saw, in the sense of this this reduced uh, capital. Next. Just Robin, what was that you you quoted from a letter he wrote to his wife Emily on a grand tour he took of Italy? And he he was in Italy and he wrote home to 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 Lady Emily and said, uh, I, "I keep seeing all the details I thought I invented." <laughs> but here again are these uh, these mysterious capitals that. Uh, uh, seem to be connected by imaginary or an internal column, and again, a base piece here. Notice that the proportions of the of the meta piece continues correctly as if there were uh, two there. Next. And we've actually seen uh, quite a few of these already. This is back at the Midland Bank. He would typically do this in this fashion. He'd have the actual column here, and then again over I guess six metopes, we have the uh, phantom column, which is buried inside the wall. And they're very interesting little details like these, where the columns sort of come out and go back in. Next. Here we go, the, the uh, capital, the base. Next. This is, is uh, to me, the most cubist of, of his buildings. This is pretty late. This is Middleton Manor, and I, I think uh, Lutchen's son Robert might have been, been, been the, he uh, was co-architect or not the lead designer on this, but it's, it's there are just a number of fascinating things about it. This wall, this plane is uh, straight up and down. This plane is slightly sloped, so there's a tiny little triangle of a wall right here so the, by the time they get up here, you get a corner where he puts in one of these capitals. This piece down here, you can probably see it better in my drawing. Uh, this is the sort of frame molding that you would have typically surrounding a, a, a doorway, a major doorway in a place like this. But it would be projecting. Here he's recessed back into the wall and you see it literally Again, like the capital is captured within the mass of the building. Okay, next. 
Uh, one of the things that we comment on regularly about Lutchens is uh, that he likes games and puzzles and uh, there's a there's a routine for him in entering homes and this is gray walls which there's a been touched on often in our webinars but what's quite amazing is that he's regularly presents you with a choice and no no clear direction you can go right or left when you come in um from the from the road you can either go right to what it turns out to be a service yard or you go left down to the house when you get to the house you have a similar choice here you have a similar choice here he's he's toying with you and he's playing with you uh, the the previous slides show this sort of game and it takes great pleasure in the mystery of these columns which appear and disappear. Uh, we know he was a big fan of Sam McKayley, who was a mannerist. And I think there's a certain gamesmanship in the three-dimensional reality of mannerist architecture. Lutchen's facility with three dimensions, and this ties back to what he learned by drawing through glass. Um, he had an ability to see the consequences or, or to define a direction for himself. So we have what is an apparent perfect symmetry between these two gate lodges. That's either side of this, oh, I'm sorry, you're standing here and you're looking this way, right? They're very different. This one is small. This one's quite a bit larger. But the way he masked them gives you the illusion of perfect symmetry. And uh, so his, his mastery here is in more than one dimension. Uh, I'll end with the info. Um, it's, uh, it airs Lutchen's sketch of it. Uh, predictable uh, in its its layout. Um, I know many of you have been there. It's about as emotional an architecture experience as you could have to, to go to this place. There were, uh, I think I have these numbers right, there were 400,000 uh, British and Commonwealth uh, soldiers killed at the, at the Battle of the Somme. Uh, next slide. And a lot of them are buried in this 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 part of France, uh, and of course in the nineteen twenties and longer, people came to visit their son's grave, their husband's grave, their father's grave. Uh, but for seventy thousand, seventy five thousand, I think uh, people who died there, there wasn't anything because there weren't any graves, there weren't any bodies. So. Uh, the purpose of this memorial was that it had the, it had the name of all 70,000 of those missing people. And it became the place where you could go to visit the grave. Uh, and people did that. What is incredible. Next slide. And can I just comment here that yeah. it's amazing the, uh, the War Graves Commission, even today, if they find DNA evidence or, or any other evidence, of 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 a man's body, they will then bury it with a with a marker, and the name is taken off the wall. So the process continues. I think if you look at the upper right, a corner of the right hand slide, that is what has happened. I think it's been restored anyway, but you will see places where the names have been been erased. the The amazing thing is people are still coming, one hundred ten years later. Uh, the day I was there, uh, I, there were at least 50 people. You can see all these wreaths. Uh, these are from schools, small towns, maybe a cricket club or something where they they send a wreath in memory of their, their members who lie there. And there are lots of these little, little crosses uh, that have a poppy at the center and a particular name on it. And again, uh, these would be their 
great nephews, their great grandchildren, or whatever. But it's still very, uh, very emotional place. Mm -hmm. Next, this goes to another sculptural aspect of Lutchen's uh, work. This the sense that there's some force inside the stone pushing to get out. And uh, I, I like I like to call it pregnant in the sense that it's, there's something, uh, there's literally a slight bulge inside the, on the first surface of these these stones. This is, this piece that you see in front of you is called the memorial, I think it's called the Stone of Remembrance. Uh, it was designed by Lutyens, the uh, Motto there, I think, is written by Kipling. There, there's all there's one in every British military cemetery, whether in France or in England, and it's uh, to their credit. I mean, it's one thing about the upfall. There's there's never anything uh, religious in any way in any of the legends pieces because the people that died there were from multitude of of backgrounds. But in any case, in this stone. There are no straight lines or planar surfaces. In fact, uh, in theory, what's happening is these surfaces are all segments of spheres. The diameter, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the radius of that sphere, uh, this is what I love about the legends, it's 1,808 feet and nine inches. <laughs> And it never, the Legends book never explains why. <laughs> anyway, uh, but again, each of these is actually a segment of the sphere. The interesting test, if you go there, uh, put your eye right here and see if you can see this bulge. And I did it and I was convinced that I could. And then I went back and read somebody like Gavin Stamp and he said, oh no, you can't see it. It's just, so, but I wanted to see it so bad <laughs> that uh, I saw it. Anyway, uh, but you'll see this kind of bulging, this kind of, of, of uh, pregnant sense in a lot of the, uh, well, you'll see it in the moldings, for example. Next. This is um, this wall, which goes all the way around the building is where the names are there. I don't think there are any names in this wall. You can see them over here. And notice that it is the frontmost surface of this wall. You might say that this piece had been projected outward, but in fact, it's that everything else has been carved out behind it. Notice these little cutouts here, here, and here that set off the... Uh, the, uh, the piece where the names are. And it's particularly true of this. I mean, normally moldings like this are quite common, of course, but normally they would project, you would select the wall to come down and do this. And Lutyens pulls this back so that this piece, which is again, normally additive becomes subtractive. And next, here you can see it. Uh, again right here where it's the setting off of this what is really what is the memorial part of, of the building uh this is uh going back to this issue of height and perception this is a moment where Lutyens actually did something to to affirm to make you realize the height of the building there are uh, there's very little trim in the building. There are these ropes or these moldings you saw along the base. There are no uh, cornices. There are no uh, moldings around on the horizontal parts. There are moldings on all of these arches. And uh, there are four different sizes. You notice that this piece this is the smallest one, which occurs right here. That repeats at every molding so that you can literally gauge that as, as seeing how this scalar transformation takes place. Next. This is my uh, uh, scalar, uh, 
try to get these all the same size, but again, this is the smallest door. This is the big arch. And this is the molding, the largest molding, which is there and the smallest, which is here. And again, notice that this is flat. This is flat. That This is actually the only place where there are uh, modulations. Next. Again, this is the smallest one, which is right here. Next. This is the second one, which is here. Next. This is actually the one that's back here. Next. And this is the uh, the main the main archway. Next. Very interesting. This goes to this issue of the shallow uh, sculpture that, that legends like. This is, uh, notice that this molding is going along and then suddenly it takes a sharp turn here. You won't find this detail in any books of classical architecture. This is my Photoshop view of the more conventional way of doing a molding. That is, it gets bigger and bigger and farther and farther away from the wall. Legends didn't want this to project that far. He wanted it tied up against the brick. So he put in this rather odd piece here to uh, basically take it back to the wall. What next? Uh, I am an architect and not a historian. So it's important for me to declare my prejudices. I rarely draw, on, I keep a sketchbook, certainly, and I've certainly spent some time in the English landscape, not as much as Lutches and his friends. I usually draw orthogonally. This is my sketch. Of, this is another Midland Bank in Piccadilly. But I find that I was very interested in this. This is goes back to Sandy Cayley again, this, this sort of tension between the brick parts of this wall and the stone and about how they're the, the ratio between the two is so tightly controlled. Next. But uh, this is, uh, this isn't Lutyens, this is uh, St. John's College, Cambridge, but it's two views of the same thing. This is the main gateway. And if you start drawing this in perspective, you very quickly, the task becomes to compose the drawing. You've got to make sure that this corner goes right there, that these pieces are in the right place. If you're just simply drawing it orthogonally, you get far more concerned about the way pieces go together. And you don't worry about whether you're going outside the boundaries of the uh, the drawing or not. So I, I, I disagree with Edwin seriously on this point. I think this is the way to, the way I understand architecture. Uh, next. Uh, everything on the internet has ads these days, and this presentation is no exception. It's an ad for myself. Uh, the drawing on the, or the, this is my first book, which has this chapter on legends. I did not, not design this cover. It was not my idea to have falling water coming out of the, the dome at New Delhi. That was the designer's decision. I did design this cover. This is a book I have coming out uh Hopefully in, in March, it's on uh, rustic architecture in America. Most of it is logs. This particular building by Mary Coulter at the Grand Canyon is stone, but it's uh, it's where I am. And then there are these three in between if you're interested. So again, I uh, this has been a lot of fun. It's been uh, it's been great to revisit a lot of these issues that I looked at some time ago and uh, and find some new. So thank you all for having me. Thank you very much. Marcos, you got some questions or? Yep. <laughs> I'm just uh, actually trying to turn my video on. Um, let's see. I'm not sure why I'm not appearing. We can see you. Oh, you can see me. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so hello. That was a fascinating webinar so far there's a couple of questions um uh, a point from uh, mark lutchens uh is uh not a question but a suggestion edwin's father was a 
good artist and an inventor as well. He invented a, a rangefinder for the army when a soldier. I would, I would be surprised if Edwin's technique of sketching on glass wasn't an idea which originated from his father. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. point. Yeah, I've always thought it'd be a great way to keep him occupied. Take this frame of glass and go out and sketch. <laughs> and stop and, stealing my paper. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very ecological. Um, and then Candia just made a comment that uh, in one of the slides, it was not Liverpool, but Manchester for the Midland Bank on the left. But I think that the next slide showed that. So that's all I, good. I apologize. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, Daniel Morales said, uh, might it not be that having developed a good eye is why many of his designs appear geometrically constructed? Maybe a bit of both. So, Well, as I said, there is uh, that article and many others, a lot of anecdotes about him using proportional systems. And I think his own... Uh, well, the famous story is is Robert Legends wrote this book with this chapter on it. I can't remember what it's called. Something about planes. It's it's, it's a very elaborate proportional system. The, the armature of planes. The armature of planes that he said he used all the time. And then uh, I think one of Robert's sisters said, no, nah, he read that and he didn't, didn't make any sense. To so <laughs> I'm staying out of this argument. <laughs> but I, I guess I... My, it just seems that that's what he would do. He would use it if it seemed useful mm -hmm. and that he wouldn't feel obliged. He said, well, I won't be consistent if I don't use this the next time I do a bank or whatever. So, mm -hmm. Over, you had a good point that, that you felt like Lechens was looking at both both ways of designing all the time. Yeah, I think Car it's... Carving away it's, and... and... Absolutely, I think... He was, I mean, obviously the versatility is, um, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine possessing the skill. He, in the proportioning systems, we found that in some instances, he would just use a simple series of squares and subdivisions. In other word, in others, it was a root two. In others, he would take it on to a golden section, the way some of these illustrations. So I think it, it's what kind of fit into his general idea. And then he'd employ the proportioning to regularize what his intent was. What was really interesting for me when doing the looking at it was in those sketches of Homewood early in his career. And in one of those initial sketches, which bears a resemblance to where Homewood ended up, but was still very much a in process drawing that you could overlay the same proportioning diagrams that we generated on it. And they were true to the original, um, what looks like a very exploratory sketch. Um, the other thing that I think is really fascinating and, and what Ed touched on quite a bit is his idea about diminution in very small increments going up and how that worked not just in terms of the reading of the facade and the detail and the entablature, but it also worked in the window jams so that there was that same diminution in the side view of the jam because he's tapering things back as well as reducing the courses. It just, he, he doesn't stop. He just keeps going. So. Uh, Gosh, um, I think we're actually out of time and there's a couple of questions that I don't think we have time to answer, but there is one very moving comment by David Pearson that he has, he, uh, he said, I have two great uncles that have, have their names on the wall um, at Thiepval and I visited the monument in 2016. It was very emotional. So that's also something, you know, when we talk about you know, dimensions and proportions is, is to keep in mind that kind of emotional engagement that his work also has. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there's some more comments and questions, but we are <laughs> out of time. So I just wanted to round it off and say, you know, thank you both, um, Ed and Oliver, for making such a, an incredible uh, webinar, which hopefully will be um, 
of interest to future generations as we actually after a while we post these on youtube on our youtube channel Lutchens trust america and it becomes a kind of repository of information um so with that said um hopefully you can join us on the web next webinar which will be um robin what in a, two months november november exactly and it will probably be about memorials yeah okay you can also join us as members <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> okay well thanks for listening and hope to see you on the next one thank Take you care. thank you bye-bye